Now that we know more about corals and the reefs that they form, let's go back to this map and try to understand what the limiting factors are for carbonate coral reefs. Well, as we look at this distribution, it becomes clear that temperature is likely to be important. In fact, carbonate reef systems do not persist where temperatures drop below 18 degrees Celsius. At the same time, we also know that light levels need to be high enough to sustain the photosynthetic rates of the symbiotic dinoflagellates in the corals. And in this case, it's not only the sun that needs to shine brightly, but also that the water column, the medium through which light is trying to penetrate, is clear enough, that it doesn't have a lot of sediments and particles in it. So even in some locations, such as the west coast of Africa, where there's enough sunlight and it's warm enough for coral reefs to form, they're poorly developed because of the influence of large rivers bringing sediments and nutrients down into coastal areas and reducing the ability of sunlight to penetrate the water column to the reefs below. Another important factor is the amount of CO2 in the water column, which if it gets too high will decrease the carbon and iron concentration and thereby restrict the rate of calcification by corals and other calcifying marine organisms. This is often represented as the degree of saturation of the water column for the crystalline forms of calcium carbonate, aragonite and calcite. See how the degree of saturation of aragonite declines as one moves from the equator to areas where there's significant upwelling of high CO2 water? Dr Joni Klepas has looked at the environmental factors associated with over 1,000 coral reef locations worldwide. This table summarises her work. Take a look at this table and explore her conclusions with respect to the other limiting factors of the formation of carbonate coral reefs such as nutrients and salinity levels. From the table you can see that when conditions are warm, clear, sunlit and shallow, then carbonate reefs will almost certainly form. However, there is one observation about coral reefs that didn't make sense to the people who first began to study them. And this is the fact that the water column associated with coral reefs is exceedingly clear and devoid of nutrients. In fact, when you measure the concentration of inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus in waters associated with coral reefs, you'll find that the levels are so low that they would predict that coral reefs should not exist at all. And of course, this seems to be at extreme odds with the high productivity and biodiversity of coral reef ecosystems. Normally ocean waters would have to have high nutrient concentrations to power the levels of primary productivity that we see on coral reefs. In fact the concentration of nutrients is so low in tropical waters that people have coined the phrase nutrient deserts to describe them. Charles Darwin pondered on this observation as he travelled the world on the ship called the Beagle. He was also puzzled by how such productive and diverse ecosystems could exist in these otherwise impoverished waters. This became known to some as Darwin's paradox. So what explains Darwin's paradox? One of the clues comes from the dual nature of reef building corals which are essentially the engineers and architects of the structure of coral reefs. Now, what do I mean by the dual nature of corals? Well, as we've already discussed, corals can eat plankton, they can absorb small particles that flow by using their tentacles. In this way, corals are particle feeders and thereby consumers. However, because corals have symbiotic dinoflagellates in their tissues, they are also able to act like primary producers, trapping sunlight using their symbionts with the energy flowing into their tissues. So corals are both primary producers while at the same time as being heterotrophic consumers. Well, while that is pretty clever, it doesn't quite explain Darwin's paradox. What else might be going on? Well, one of the other features of having your primary producer and heterotrophic consumer closely coupled together is that inorganic nutrients that would normally flow out into the dilute water column of tropical coral reefs after the coral breaks down the proteins and other compounds are instead provided directly to the primary producer, in this case, the dinoflagellate symbiont. That is, the symbionts are fixing CO2, soaking up waste 
nitrogen and phosphorus and passing it directly to the coral host. The coral host then breaks down these compounds and passes back the inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus, the waste products, back to the dinoflagellate symbionts and so on. The net effect of this is an internal recycling of energy and nutrients back and forth between the reef building coral and its intracellular symbionts. So these incredible symbioses allow corals to be extremely effective at recycling the few nutrients that are available to them. However, it doesn't quite solve Darwin's paradox and it does not tell us where the nutrients came from. In week three of this course, Associate Professor Sophie Dove will give you a lecture on how organisms can produce nutrients, such as ammonia, from sources such as nitrogen in the atmosphere, and in this way, bring key nutrients into the system. This will be the final piece of the puzzle explaining how such a diverse and abundant ecosystem can thrive in otherwise nutrient impoverished oceans. And the magic of symbiosis doesn't end there. There are many other interactions between organisms that involve the conservation of nutrients. Corals can benefit from the fish that reside at night time between their branches, receiving the nutrients that are excreted by the fish among the branches. So the fish get protection, the corals get nutri nutrients for their symbiotic algae. One of the most famous interactions on coral reefs is that that goes on between a small group of fishes known as anemone fish and large symbiotic anemones. Another famous symbiotic reef dweller is the giant clam. In this lecture, we considered the distribution and abundance as well as the unique characteristics of coral reefs, particularly those which have intrigued biologists such as Charles Darwin. In the next lecture, we will explore Heron Island, which is a small sandy cay on a platform reef at the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. Our intention here is to bring together the information we've discussed so far in the context of a living, breathing coral reef ecosystem.